Good afternoon. I want to say morning because of the title. I apologise for the title, by the way. Actually, no, I don't. Um, welcome to the dawn of a new era. I'm Phil Nash. Uh, many of you know me from uh, various places, actually, but uh, I am developer advocate at JetBrains for the C++ tools. If you haven't seen us on the booth yet, do come and say hello. We're all very friendly. Uh, we're there all week. Well, till tomorrow evening, anyway. Um, well, we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about error handling in C++, the past, present, but mostly the future of error handling, or possible futures. We're going to be discussing a number of different proposals that are all in flight at the moment, most of them at very early stage, so uh, very much subject to change. We may not get all or even any of these, um, but I think it's really important that we are aware of what's going on, wh where we're going in terms of such a fundamental feature in C++ is error handling. So that's really the, the idea of this talk, to raise that awareness. Now, I think my animation has finished. By the way, this uh, background image is from uh, the, the last JetBrains uh, trip uh, last winter to the Austrian Alps. This is the view out of my window. It's a pretty cool place to work. All right. I want to start just by going back for a bit of history. Um, although, before we even do that, but this is what we're really going to be focusing on. Uh, this proposal here, P0709, zero overhead deterministic exceptions, throwing values. I know many people are now aware of this uh, proposal to some degree or another, and I've also done previous talks on it. We'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about a number of the supporting proposals and, in some cases, alternate proposals as well. Um, let's say this is not the first talk I've done on this subject. I did this one last year. This is actually me just downstairs last year. I did a number of other places as well. Who's seen me give this talk? Optional, it's not a failure. So, a handful of people, not everyone. This is really a follow-on from that talk. But if you haven't seen the first one, don't worry, I will summarise the essential points before we really get into the meat of this, the second part. But I wanted to bring this up because this is not actually the first talk I've done by this name, either. Earlier um, last year, I did this one, so same uh, title, but this was given at a mobile developers conference, and it was in the context of Swift. And this is the first version of this talk. Well, why am I talking about it here? Well, I've had my foot in the, the Swift world for, well, right since the beginning, actually, as well. And uh, around the time that Swift 2 came out, they also introduced a complete, comprehensive, cohesive set of error handling features. And once I'd fully assimilated exactly what was uh, being given to us, I came to the conclusion that it was probably the most advanced error handling strategy of any programming language today, which is a really bold claim. But I do stand by that. And if anybody does actually know any different or has a, uh, an idea for another language that does it even better, do let me know. I'm really keen to hear. But I do think it's definitely up there. But the other thing I noticed around that time was that there were inklings that various things in C++, but going in a similar direction. And I wasn't entirely sure that we were all heading for the same ultimate destination. So I decided to do the same talk in C++, say this is where we could be heading. This is what they're doing in Swift. If we make some language changes and some changes here and there, we could end up in the same place. That was the idea behind that talk. But before I actually did the talk, Herb's paper that we just looked at, P0709, didn't have a paper number then, uh, came into my um, awareness. I read through that and realized it was talking about exactly the same thing, which is quite heartening that actually as a community we are definitely moving in the right direction. So I sort of changed what I was talking about to lead up to that. So that was really at the end of my previous talk. And then I sort of tacked on at the end. You know, there's some other proposals as well. So this talk's going to dig much more into that and the sporting proposals. But just going back a little bit further, I've actually been interested in alternate error handling strategies for, um, for quite a few years now, starting probably with this one, exploding return types. Who's heard of exploding return types? Let's see, two hands, possibly, which is pretty normal. I've done this talk a few times. Sometimes nobody's hands go up. Um, nobody really does this anymore. It never really caught on anyway. And there's, there's a couple of reasons why, which we'll, we'll touch on. But um, I think I first heard about it from this talk by Andre Alexandrescu, back in 2007, choose your poison, exceptions or error codes. Based on the realization that 
you know, exceptions aren't always the, the best choice of error handling for, for a number of reasons. The previous talk digs into that a lot more. So you know, often we still need to use error, type, um, error codes. Trouble is, the decision as to whether you use one or the other is often best made at the call site. But we have to sort of bake it in in the implementation. So this is the technique for actually putting that choice at the call site, but also forcing you to deal with it. Because that's a big problem with, with error codes. It's very easy to ignore them. We didn't have no discard back then, which really helps a lot. So the idea with this, well, it's based around this template, likely T, and has a couple of interesting properties. One which we'll come back to, which is that it can hold an actual return type that you wanted or avoid, or the exception that would have been thrown otherwise. But the bit I want to focus on now is this bit. If you don't actually check whether it's an error or not, the destructor will throw, will throw the exception, hence the exploding return types. So it forces you to do it, but it does that at runtime, which is not ideal, so that's the first problem. The second one, of course, is it uses the destructor. And even back then, this was generally considered a bad idea to throw from destructors. Um, since then, of course, C++11 uh, makes destructors no except by default, so that's really put the nail in the coffin. But actually, I dug a little bit more, and that wasn't even the first time this was proposed. This was a um, post from Complang C++ Moderated in the year 2000, and it doesn't have the, the exceptions embedded in there, but it does have a check. You know, if you haven't actually checked whether there's an error or not, it will throw from the destructor. And um, it's actually referenced even earlier work by Lisa Lippincott and uh, separately James Cans. Um, interestingly, uh, Lisa actually popped up in this thread and thought it's quite amusing, this, this quote for this comment she made. Let's not re repeat the mistakes of the past. Model the copy construction and assignment on the current auto pointer, not the old broken one. Which I think really emphasizes that these are really different times. As I say, a lot of these techniques haven't really survived to, to today. They, they seem a bit odd looking back, but that's where we were back then. Moving forwards a bit, after C++11, Andre was still at it. Systematic error handling in C++. He had a very similar type, but he's taken out the, the, the throwing destructor. But still has the other essential property of it's either the return type he wanted, or in fact, if we uh, go in a bit, it's either the, the T, the return type, or the exception preventing its creation. And that turned out to be the more important property of this type. Notice also the name, expected T. If that sounds familiar, it's because as well as boost expected, there's now this proposal, well, it's actually been going for a few years now, stood expected, uh, still on track for standardization, but hasn't quite made it in yet. Didn't quite make it into 20, unfortunately. Um, but there's a lot of interest in it. Um, and that, that really is the evolution of that same idea. It's a type which contains either the, the return type you wanted or some sort of error type to indicate what went wrong. Now, this sort of type is certainly not unique to C++. Uh, lots of other languages have very similar types. Most of them are called result. I mean, here's just a handful of languages I'm familiar with. Um, Haskell, of course, always has to go one better. It's got the either type, which is a bit more generic. Um, notice Swift on there. It actually says, only as of Swift 5, which came out earlier this year. But I said earlier that you know, this whole thing started because I thought Swift, as of Swift 2, had the most advanced error handling strategy. So how come it only got this in Swift 5? Well, I think it's because when this is really what I would consider a stepping stone to where we really want to be. And they just leapfrogged ahead right to the final solution. And I only came back and added this because there are still some uses for it, particularly in uh, async and other uh, things where you need to hold on to the intermediate representation before later dealing with it. So they've added that for that purpose. And there's a really nice interop story as well. But yeah, this is a, a common idea across many languages. They all have different ways of, of dealing with it, which we'll come back to um, in, a, in a bit. But I want to have a look at how you use stood expected or something like it in C++. So here's some example code. Pretty straightforward. It's just going to convert a, uh, a string into an integer. Um, don't worry too much about the implementation. It's not the best. But the important points are, first of all, the return type. By the way, I, I favor training return types everywhere. Uh, that's just my style. There's nothing significant about that. If you want to 
seem to take that even further, though. Do come to my lightning talk this evening. I'll say no more about that. So the return type here is, uh, we actually just want to return an int, but we're going to return a std expected of int or an error type. In this case, we're making it a std domain error. It doesn't have to be an exception type. It could be anything. It could be a std string, if you like. Um, here we're making an exception. And then we either return, well, at the end, we can just return the raw value. But in the error case, we return this std make unexpected. It's just a factory function, really, uh, just to make overloading a bit cleaner. Um, but all it does, really, is just create a, a std expected of the right type. And we just give it the, the exception type. So pretty straightforward. Very easy to understand. Once you know what's going on, very easy to use. So how would you call that? Something like this. So we call our parse int. We capture the result there. Um, and then we have to test the result. So like uh, std optional, it has a Boolean operator overload. So you can treat it like a, a pointer. Um, and again, to get the value out in the non-error case, much like a pointer dereference and much like std optional, uh, you can, you can dereference it. Um, the difference to std optional is only really in the error case. We now have access to the error object. And because in this case it's an exception type, we can do dot what on it. Again, a pretty simple, straightforward code. It's actually quite nice. Yeah, no, no wonder we want something like this. But there is a problem. And really, I think this highlights it. So the, the yellow code is what we actually wanted to write. The rest is just, just the boilerplate to do with error handling. And this is just like a simple, effectively one line example. And it's already dominated by the error code. And it gets worse as you try to scale up. So let, well, let's do that. Let's um, add some more functions that we want to compose together. So here's another one that operates on two integers. Um, again, just a noddy example to, uh, to illustrate the point. So it's trying to divide them and allow for di division by zero. So again, it returns a, um, a std expected of int or a, or a std domain error. Um, same pattern as before, really. But notice that we want to pass in an integer. So we're going to have to unwrap the one we get from the previous function. And let's add one more function. Um, no error handling here, just taking an int and returning an int, just to see how that affects things. Here's how you might use it. Now, if you're looking through line by line, it's easy to follow, it's straightforward, understandable stuff, all makes sense. But really, it's, it's almost like all boilerplate at this point. And you, you really lose track of the logic at a glance. You, just, you have to actually read it through line by line to understand it. And on the happy path, it ends up sort of nested right in the middle there. So it's inverted from, from what you actually want. We can improve it a bit if we use early returns. That does help. But actually, not that much. And compare those two. Yeah, it's better, but it's still mostly error handling. And that's, that's a real problem. So I mentioned earlier that lots of other languages have a similar type. Surely, you know, they must have solved this. You may have also noticed that most of those languages are either functional languages or functional-inspired languages. It must be a functional language um, solution to this. So, of course, we need to talk about monads. <laughs> so we'll now have a 45-minute session on No, we won't. We'll <laughs> we don't actually need to understand what monads are, just what they're going to do for us here. There's another proposal. Uh, P0798, monadic operations for, notice, stood optional. So um, we're talking about std expected, which is very similar. This is actually based on a blog post uh, by uh, Cybrand, this proposal by, by Cy. Um, the, the original blog post talked about optional and expected. But of course, you can only propose it for std optional, because only that's actually in the standard uh, right now. The intention is, as soon as std optional uh, stood expected is in, there'll be a similar proposal for that. And this is, um, didn't quite make the cut for 20. I think we just ran out of time. Uh, it's been going through quite nicely, so we should get this, well, certainly in 23. But what does it actually give us? Let's have a look at the abstract. So it says, I propose adding transform and then and or else member functions to std optional or std expected to support this style of monadic programming. Now, if you do have a, a functional programming background, you may be more familiar with the terms map and bind for transforming and then. They're the same concept. We'll look at exactly what they give us in a minute. What about the or else? 
Well, in the context of error handling, that pretty much models catch. It's, you know, having um, gone through all the operations you wanted to perform, if there were any errors, they all get filtered to the or else. So that's like your catch block. So how would that look in our example? This is where we got to. Like the best we could do before. With those operators, but well, they're not quite operators, but those, those operations, you do this. Let me show you that again. That code down to that code. I think you'll agree that's a massive improvement. Not just in the amount of code, but just in the flow as well. If only comes in at the top, you can see the next line, the next line. And I haven't put the, the or else in here. That'll just be another one uh, on the end. I don't, don't know why I didn't put that. Very much like the same sort of linear code that we have with exceptions, really. We've just got a bit more. We've still got a bit of boilerplate to do with the error handling. It's, it's still there. But it, you can almost like, you know, let it blur out into the background. But you have to write it. It's a bit of a pain. So much better, but yep, it's still did a fair amount of boilerplate. This is really bleeding edge at this point. This is based on a proposal that hasn't been written yet on top of another proposal that hasn't made it in yet. So we're getting way ahead of ourselves, and we're still not there. All right. So this is where we got to. But we have another form of error handling in C++ today. It's called exceptions. You may have heard of it. This example with exceptions looks like this. Here's the competition. This is why this is a problem, because we've got to say, well, instead of doing that, we want to do this, and this is the best we, we can do. It's, it's a massive difference still. So what can we do? Well, this is where P0709 comes in. Um, we'll see why this is different to actual exceptions in a bit. But how does this look with P0709? Well, basically this. Let me do that again. That's exceptions, static exceptions. And in fact, some of this is, is even optional. We'll dig into that. So let's have a look at the, um, a bit closer at the, uh, the parse int function. Now with P0709, well, I'll just highlight the important bits. So, Notice we've got a froze keyword on there. That's not the same as the deprecated fro keyword, although it does serve a similar role. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't worry too much about that. What this really does, and we'll look at this a bit more in a minute, is it effectively says to the compiler, it's as if we are returning something like stood expected of our return value or some error type. So if you think of it as a compiler just doing a transformation like that. Got the throw keyword, pretty much the same as the throw keyword we have now. The only difference is in a function that's marked throws, instead of using some sort of ex exception handling mechanism, it's going to effectively return that expected like type instead, like, like we had before. So we can think of this as all very much like syntactic sugar. And at the bottom, we have this try keyword. It's probably the most controversial bit. This, we've started discussing this in the, in the committee already. There was a, a session in uh, Cologne back in July where it was uh, put in front of the evolution group for the first time. And this was the bit they really didn't like. Um, so currently, it looks like we're probably not going to get the try keyword. But I, I'm still hopeful. Let's say, these early days, we have a few more rounds. I think this is really important. And I'll, uh, I'll try to explain why. Actually, my, my previous talk does go into this a lot more. So because we've got that froze keyword up there, we know all the functions that we're calling, which are marked froze, they may throw one of these types of exceptions. Uh, we don't have to put that try keyword there. It's not required by the compiler. But if it's required by the language, the compiler can check it. It can tell us when we miss it. And when it's there, we can look at our code and see which lines of code may throw, which, which sounds pretty good. makes the code easier to reason about. Problem is. If you think of exceptions as we had them today, they could happen from almost, almost anywhere. And the worry is that our code is just going to have try everywhere. And then it just becomes noise and we don't pay attention to it. Which is why P0709 has all these extra parts to it that say, well, actually, if we do this and we do that and we do that. We, I won't dig into it now. But once you remove all these other, other parts to exception handling, there's actually only a few places left that really need it. We'll talk more about that at the end. But it means you're left with 
just the places you actually really do want to know, this line may throw. And that's why I think try is really important. So we'll come back to that later. But in terms of, and this is about always have trouble explaining, it's an optional part of the proposal in the sense that we can have the proposal with or without it. If it's in there, it's a required part of the language. Hope I make that distinction clear. All right. Um, so we already went through that. Okay. So just uh, backing out a little bit. So we, um, if we're using the try keyword, then the, the function that we're in must be marked froze as well. Again, that can be checked by the compiler statically. So the compiler really helps us to, to make sure we mark everything up correctly and use the correct terms. We can, of course, also use try and catch, pretty much as we can today. But with one big difference, the type that we are catching is this std error, which is a value type. And it's not dynamic, it's not polymorphic, it's a single value. The whole of the second half of this talk is going to be discussing std error. It's actually quite an interesting type. But it's, it's largely where all the magic happens and, and why this is actually a better solution. But before we get to that, the one thing I really want to emphasize is this effective isomorphism between the keywords I've just introduced with either new or, or uh, modified meanings, uh, try, throw, froze, and something like stood expected, as we, as we showed before. When you have the froze keyword, as we said, that implies something like returning a stood expected. The throw keyword is like returning a make unexpected. And the try keyword, if we have it at all, is standing in for those magnetic operations at best. That's actually doing most of the work of uh, cleaning up our code for us. So it's a shame that people are objecting to the three characters instead of a screen full, but that's where we are. Now, I, I've said this is effectively like that. In practice, the compiler is not rewriting it to that. And in fact, the compiler even has greater opportunity for optimization. In particular, the way it can use the, the return channel. Um, the stood expected needs like an extra uh, word in there, just as a discriminator to say whether it's one type or the other. But if we're baking this into the return channel, we can use an unused bit in one of the registers. So there's actually no extra overhead in most cases um, in terms of space on the return channel. And in terms of runtime, um, there's like effectively an if statement that can often be optimized away um, using branch prediction at some point. So this has actually been termed a, a negative overhead abstraction in the ideal case. We don't have an implementation yet, so we can't really verify that, but that's, that's really what we're looking at. This is actually um, potentially as performant as not having an error, error handling, even in the error path case, which is actually quite significant. So I went into that much more in the previous talk. OK, so back to this. I said that the interesting type here was std error. And I didn't really discuss this at all in my previous talk. What is it? Another proposal. P1028, uh, SG14 status code and standard error object for P0709, zero overhead deterministic exceptions. So it sounds like this is purely a supporting paper for the, for the main one. But it's not. Don't let that fool you. This actually stands on its own, on its own merits. And even if we don't get P0709, I really hope we get this, and I'll hope to explain why. All right, so what is it? It's got a bit of an unwieldy name. Um, again, let's have a look at the, the abstract. It starts off, a proposal for the replacement in new code of the system header, system error, with a substantially refactored and lighter weight design, which meets bottom C++ design and implementation. OK, so this is not something entirely new. This is a refinement over something we already had. And it mentions the system error header. Who here is familiar with the system error header? Seeing three forehands? Again, that's pretty normal. We've had this since C++11. Most people are not familiar with it if they've heard of it at all. The main type in there is um, a stood error code. We'll talk about that in a moment. So. Before we get to that, so we're talking about std error. So this is the new proposed type. 
What is it exactly? It's this. So using alias for error status code, erased system code value type. Yeah, so we cleared that up. Now we know exactly what it is. <laughs> All right, well, we'll have to break that apart a bit. But before we do that, we really need to understand what it is it's replacing to understand why this is the way it is. So we've established that most people are not so familiar with system error, uh, system, the system error header. So let's go back to C++11. Stood error code. It gets a little bit tricky. Some of the type names here, they're all very similar. So std error code is the one we have now as of C++11. std error is the one that's proposed to replace it. So we just dropped the, the underscore code. So we're talking about the C++11 one for the moment. Here's a sketch of what it looks like. So here's the members. Uh, there's a load of member functions. We won't discuss all of them. There's a couple of important ones. So it has an integer value and a pointer to something called an error category. Okay. What's interesting about this is you should be able to see this will fit in two words. And that's an important property of, of this. Um, here's some of the, uh, the important members. So you've got a couple of accessors, something to get the value type out, something to get the error category out by reference, but it's still just an accessor. We'll talk more about those in a moment. Uh, so it's also got, uh, go back, message and um, a, a Boolean operator. Message is interesting. Now, where's, it, where's that coming from? So we'll, we'll dig into that a bit more. But um, I'm not going too far ahead. Error category is the bit that really needs explaining. What is that? So let's let's have a look. An error category. We can often think of it as an error a domain for errors. And usually, when people try to explain error category, they say it's a domain for errors which sort of begs the question, why is it not called an error domain? Well, that's what it is. And really, it's just like a, don't want to use the word namespace because that has a particular meaning, but it's, it's a, um, a, a universe for uh, error values. And they're, they're usually defined as enums. There's a, an associated class along with that. We have a, an enum where that integer value in the error code is going to correspond to one of these values. Simple as that. And built into the standard as a C++11 is this one on the, on the left, uh, C, which is actually all of the POSIX error codes. We have them in the C++11 standard, all of the POSIX error codes in the Xenum. But you can add your own, like this one on the right, which I think every, every class should have. Um, if you define your own error category, then you need to define your own error category class which looks something like this. Again, there's lots more methods on there, but these are the, the important um, overloads, overrides, sorry, that, that you'll need to implement. So you derive something from error category, override these methods. So we see message in there, and this is how the error code gets it out, it forwards it onto error category, passes the integer in. Within the error category, you know what your enum is, so you know how to convert that to a string or Whatever it is you need to do, some sort of lookup or a split statement, doesn't matter. This is where you do it. So it's just like an extra level in, in direction to solve that problem. But what about these equivalent members? What are they all about? And maybe you notice also there's this uh, error condition type up here. We haven't talked about that yet either. So it turns out that it's really useful to be able to compare error values across domains, across error categories. So if you're looking at something on the, on the right and you want to compare it to something on the left, it's really useful to be able to do that. And that's what equivalence is all about. But you also sometimes want to compare them directly, make sure they're from the same category. So you need a way to distinguish those two. So error condition is basically the same as error code, but just a different type for overloading purposes. That's, that's all it is, which is a nice idea. It solves that problem, but it does make things a bit subtle and confusing, especially if people are only really passingly familiar with it. So it is the source of, uh, of some errors um, in encoding. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem, but it serves a useful purpose. That's, that's really, really nice. So you can actually have one-to-one, one-to-many, many many-to-many, whatever you need, relationships between error values in different categories. 
Remember, this is all in the design that we have in C++11. You think of this in terms of um, how you organize errors into hierarchies. Like today, with exceptions, we, have, we can have exception hierarchies using you know, standard polymorphism. This allows you to actually build more complex relationships that actually fit your um, error domains even better. So we get a one-to-one, one-to-many relationship. So this is a more flexible design in terms of how we categorize our errors. It's actually quite nice. So it's a shame that it's so uh, underutilized and so little known. It's used extensively in the, um, uh, the file system API and in the networking TS API. Uh, in fact, the, originally came from, both of those came from Boost, where um, uh, Boost error code was the, the start of all of this. So going back to error code itself, so we talked about message. This Boolean operator, a bit problematic. So we've got an error type. And it seems like it would be really useful if we, we can just test it with the Boolean operator to see whether it's an error or not. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily what it does. All it does is tell you whether the value is zero or not, which may or may not mean the same thing which makes this, at best, useless, unfortunately. So, a bit of a missed opportunity, so don't use that if you do use error code, uh, unless you really know what you're doing. Always compare against an actual known error type. There's a few other problems as well. Let's just uh, quickly summarize them. So, first of all, that error category pointer that we saw earlier, um, the, the pointer value itself is the identity of the error category. If you want to compare, you know, is this error category the same as this? You just compare the pointer values. That implies that they have to be singletons, which is okay until you need to have a, a header-only library within mixed dynamic libraries, and then suddenly you've got different pointer values for the same singleton type, and it all breaks. And it, this happens, so that's the problem. Depends on std string for that message. Doesn't seem like a big deal. Stood string we've had since C++ 98, it's a very common, very widely used type. Unfortunately, it's quite a heavyweight dependency if you don't need it. It brings in all sorts of things like locales and even exceptions. And you think often error code is used in cases where you're trying to avoid exceptions and other heavyweight dependencies. So it's a shame if we drag it all back in again. So this has been identified as, as an issue, uh, particularly by the SG14 uh, study group for low latency coding. Um, we, we mentioned about the Boolean conversion not being reliable, the separate error condition type being a bit tricky to use. And because it's a C11 library, when Cons Expro was just getting started, and actually it was, was rooted in, uh, in Boost originally, it's not Cons Expro at all. Whereas today, if we were starting fresh, it would probably all or mostly be Cons Expro. So, again, maybe a missed opportunity. That, um, that code can only be an integral type, which is fine if it maps onto an enum, but maybe we want it to be other types as well, like an exception pointer, say. So it's limiting us there as well. And, yeah, a bonus one. Okay, categories, probably better if they're just called domains, but not such a big deal. All right, so there's the problems with std error code that we have in C++11. How does std error, the replacement, fix those? So, starting off again, here's a sketch of the, uh, of the type. It's actually a template now, SATA's code. Um, so, the, the value type could be literally anything, because it's the template. Now, we're going to constrain it a bit more in a moment, but that sort of solves that problem straight off. And we fixed another problem. Instead of error categories, we have status code domain, they're now called domains. Brilliant. Okay. But otherwise, it's much the same. Here's the using alias we, we looked at before. And the first thing we can see is, well, it's actually talking about error status code, not status code. So what's the difference? Well, they're exactly the same thing, except that error status code is guaranteed to always be an error, whereas status code itself may not be. It may be uh, a success code. And with error status code, it verifies it in the constructor. So you can't actually construct things that are not errors. That means if you've got one, you don't have to check whether it's an error or not. So the whole issue with the Boolean operator is moot. 
You don't need to check it. Not, at least not with Arid status code. And it's not in the status code template at all. So it's another problem fixed. And it just makes it a bit easier to use. But what about this erased system code? So you might be thinking, well, OK, some sort of type erasure template. Um, so if you're not familiar with type erasure, it's just sort of a, a polymorphic type where you can um, usually stuff anything in there, and it will um, give you like a nice, simple uh, base class type that will protect you from that. In this case, the, the template parameter for erased is the type that it's going to use to get the size for its storage. So there's no heap allocations. When it creates this uh, polymorphic type, it would do it in place in something the size of, in this case, system code value type. So whatever that is, we'll have space for that. Now, it turns out system code value type boils down to int pointer t. So it's going to be something that's big enough to hold an integer or a pointer, which is exactly what we wanted. It can hold an enum or an exception pointer, say. But because it's type erased, it can be either of those things or anything that will fit in there. So that's sort of what it is, which means it's um, effectively, oh, jumping ahead, effectively this, once you expand it all out. Stood error has uh, some storage the size of an endpoint to T that you can put pretty much anything in. OK, so far, so good. Just to summarize the, the other ways that it solves those original problems, OK, domains are now called domains. So that was the easy one. That singleton problem. Now the, the identity of the domains is not based on its pointer value, but on a randomly chosen uint64 ID that you choose at design time. And there's an algorithm for, for doing it, or tool actually, to make sure it's guaranteed to be you know, unique, like a UUID. Uh, so you, you give it one of those, and that's its identity. No more problems with singletons. They can still be singletons if you want, but that's no longer a problem. The value type can be any small, I say, fits in an in pointer t, but importantly, trivially copyable, which is a concept we do have, or trivially movable type. And that trivially movable is the interesting bit, because we don't have that concept in C++ today. At least not explicitly spelt out. So we'll come back to that. As currently defined in the proposal, there's no dependency on std string. Unfortunately, the way it does that is by defining its own string type, string ref, uh, which is quite a lightweight string type, but still, having a string type in a proposal for an error code is probably not the direction we're going to go in long term. Maybe it'll get spit out. I don't know how that's going to go. But currently, that's how it solves that problem. Mostly context for as it should be. Don't have the Boolean uh, conversion. We don't need it. And makes the assumption that comparison is always equivalence. So we don't need a separate type to overload on. So there's no error condition. If you do need to do a, a direct comparison, you can just compare the individual uh, value and domain types, domain values. So it solves all those problems, one way or another. But I mentioned that the interesting part was the uh, trivially movable. Um, property of the, uh, the thing that we're holding in the in point to t storage. So like um, std error code, it fits in two CPU registers, two words. That's a really important property. But in order for it to be able to do that, you need to be able to copy things just, just by bit copying, mem copy, effectively. If you can mem copy something as either a copy or a move, then it's all fine. But we don't have this concept of trivially movable. Yeah. So we have a proposal for that as well. P1029, move relocates. In fact, we have another one as well. P1144, object relocation in terms of move plus destroy is the extra bit. So best way to understand these two papers is to actually compare them side by side. So <clears throat> they both had this part, which is actually the bit that we need for our purposes here that it has an attribute that indicates to the compiler that 
a move of this type is trivial, i.e. it can just be replaced with a mem copy. That's the bit that we needed. That's automatically true for primitives, but for your own custom types, we need actually to hint to the compiler that that's the case. So P1144 has that same attribute, but it's optional. But we, we sort of need that for, um, for our purposes here. But it also has these extra things. It's got a detection trait, um, actually defines the relocatable concept, which is not currently in the standard. Got some algorithms around it. But the bit that I sort of left off is the can reset moved from using mem copy. That's actually the bit, well, that's really the reason that we have the other paper as well. Because that's what makes this effectively a destructive move paper, which unfortunately have a long and tortuous history in the Standards Committee. But a number of attempts at getting these in, they've all failed. So this one's actually going quite well so far. But if that fails at that hurdle, we can fall back on the less ambitious paper. So we can still get the thing we need for the purposes of Studera and P0709. That's why there's two. So hopefully we'll get one or the other. And again, useful in their own right, especially P1144. So part of the overall um, error handling set of papers, but also useful in their own right. So that's stood error. That's what it is, and that's why it's useful. So bring all that back into the context of where we started, the, the P0709 static exceptions. Now, when we say froze up here, we say that that's effectively like, you know, returning stood expected of your type or stood error. And stood error itself is trivially relocatable, fits in two registers. The compiler can stuff those into registers, use that other bit. Um, it's pretty much no overhead, often zero, uh, less than zero overhead compared to other error handling strategies. That's how that works, and that's why that works. But we do need all of those for that to really um, come together like that. So we, we discussed all these proposals and how they fit together. We also talked about stood expected, another proposal that's not quite there yet, and the monadic operations for stood optional. And as I said, will, they will be one for expected once we get there. I want to bring in one other proposal that we haven't really discussed, and in fact, the proposal itself is now dead. It was in C++20, that's contracts. Famously got removed in, uh, in Cologne because it's not quite baked yet. But why have I included contracts in this discussion? So I said earlier that there are a number of optional parts to P0709 that are there in order to make sure that if you consider them all together, forget them all together, there's only going to be a few places in, in your code where you actually need to mark things with the try keyword. And it turns out that one of them is that if we have contracts in the standard, if and when we get them, there is an appetite in the, the, the library group to actually change a lot of the, the places that we currently throw exceptions in the standard library to using concepts, uh, contracts instead. They are effectively contracts. They're mostly logic errors. And we have stood logic error. And it's been said that stood logic error is itself a logic error because it, it's not something you can recover from. So we shouldn't be throwing an exception for that. But that's really the, the only instrument we have today. If, they, if we have contracts, we can replace those. And then there's a whole load of places that we don't need to, uh, we don't need to throw. And the other one we didn't talk about, the other optional part, is what happens if you run out of uh, heap, heap memory, heap exhaustion. Currently, it's, um, you throw bad alloc. And that's the other big source of uh, exception handling today. And there is a proposal, part of P0709, to say, well, by default, what if we don't throw? What if we terminate? Which sounds really controversial, actually. Not without its contra controversy, but there's much more of an appetite than, than you might think for that. And in fact, that is the Swift model as well. In Swift, if you're out of memory, your process dies. It's, it's much like a stack overflow, really. You can't recover from that. Most of the time, you can't recover from out of memory. And there's another whole talk on this we could do, but we're not going to go into today. It's a really interesting subject. Do read the paper P0709 if you're interested in this. 
Um, it goes into all of this in detail, including some of the research that's been done, some experiments that have been done. That's really fascinating. The point is, once you take those things into consideration, the things you're left with are the things where you really do need to consider the alternate error flows, uh, control flows because of error handling. And so I think the try keyword is a really important part of that. So that really concludes the main part of my talk. There's those paper numbers again. Um, all of these proposals, uh, some other supporting material, my previous talk, um, everything I can think of related to this is on this page on my uh, website, levelofindirection.com slash refs slash dawn.html. So that's the only thing you really need to, to take away. I'll leave that up there. If you can't remember levelofindirection.com, I also have the extra levelofindirection.com that redirects there. And of course, and too many levels of indirection.com can go on. But that's the end of the talk, so thank you very much. So do we have any questions? Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you've shown that you catch the error by value. What if, for instance, static analyzers say you could use uh, const reference instead? What would happen in this case? Uh, if you could use what instead, sorry? Uh, const reference instead. Constructors? No. Um, in the catch statement, yes, um, you catch std error by value. That's right. And if a static analyzer says me, uh, use const reference instead. Or const reference. Um, well, a static analyzer shouldn't say that if it knows what it's doing at that point. <laughs> that, that would be a bug in the static analyzer. Um, may, maybe they will to start with before, before they catch on. Um, the one bit I didn't talk about, actually, we reminded me, although it's a separate thing, is... <clears throat> The interoperability between uh, classic exceptions and what we're calling static exceptions. Um, if, you, if you're in a froze function and you call something that throws a dynamic exception, that dynamic exception behind the scenes is going to get caught and then put into a std error uh, as an exception pointer. That, that's why I labored the point that we could put those in there. Um, and vice versa, if a static exception is thrown into a function that's not marked froze, you can get converted the other way or an exception pointer taken out. So it does interoperate as well. And you can even have in the same function, you can catch a std error and you can catch um, other exception types by reference or const reference. So did that answer your question and more? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I have a question. We have already coroutines and futures and dot then, which are some sort of monads. And then you want to introduce new sort of monads as well. So should we just have a do notation and then get rid of this try? So if I understood the question correctly, uh, you're saying, is this just um, an overly specific solution to a monadic uh, pattern? Um, and technically, yes. And in fact, if you watch my previous talk, I do sort of build up that way. And I say, well, what if we had something like uh, Haskell's do notation? What would that look like? Uh, and you actually get very close to this. But there's, there's two things. One is it's not all the way there. And with C++ syntax, being not all the way there often means lots of extra stuff going on. Um, but also, we may not have the same scope for optimization um, that, we, that we have with this. Because we, can, we know exactly what's happening in terms of error propagation, the compiler can actually optimize more. Now, maybe. Maybe it can optimize down to the same thing, I don't know. But perhaps the bigger question is, we're a lot further away from a, um, a generic uh, monodic error handling proposal. Uh, there have been some over the years. Um, last I heard, there was one that looked promising, but it just needed a lot of work, and it's pretty slow going. So I hope we're going to get there as well. That's a separate uh, path. Um, but I think we'll get this much faster, and there are advantages to having something more tailored. Uh, and, and I think you noted as well that that's going on also with other parts of the language, like coroutines. Um, also, I mean, that was a big part of the discussion of coroutines uh, a year or so ago, was do we want something that, that's like just a more general monadic um, handling mechanism? 
Um, and that was a big distraction for a while, and people thought, no, no, we, really, we just want coroutines for now. We can solve that separately. So um, I think we need both, is the short answer. Uh, and we'll get them as they come. OK, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, hey, thanks for another talk on this uh, great subject. Um, can you recommend an implementation until we get all of these uh, 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 recommendations or, or uh, so until we get all of these dependencies in the language? If we want to get uh, like partial uh, solutions, like um, the monadic operations on std optional, uh, can you recommend a particular implementation or library that does it well that we can use in production code? Okay, so for the for the monadic operations, you can get that today, um, not on std optional itself because we can't extend the library types yet. Uh, but Cybrand actually has versions of, of optional and expected with the monadic operations on his, uh, his GitHub, which I think is also linked in my references. Um, and there, there are others, but I know that, uh, that size one exists. Uh, hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, we have a long debate that we are either exceptions or error code is which one is better? Because for error code, we have a long uh, switch case or if and then else for the error. But for the exceptions, we need to have the, like, the stack unrolling. But in your, in your f first example, we have the student uh, expected. Actually, that's a kind of a good example how we can minimize the gap between them because if we have just, okay, we are not really following exceptions. But with the later, we have you propose to try the new syntax. Actually, it becomes the, 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 the old problem again. Actually, the, the stack will be unrolled and how we can minimize the things. Um. Sounds like you're talking about two things there, but I may have misunderstood you. So one is the uh, the, the stack unrolling part, um, which yeah is going to be like error codes. So there is going to be a little bit more overhead compared to exceptions that, that we have today uh, on the uh, the happy path, um, but then not the the massive overhead that exceptions have on the error path. So there's a slight trade-off there. Um, but because of the, the things that I mentioned about the, you know, the use of that register bit, uh, branch prediction on the if statement, that should be minimal if anything at all. So I'm not sure that's actually something to worry about in practice. Again, until we have an implementation that we can really play with, it's difficult to say. Although um, in Swift, they seem to be pretty happy with that situation, and they have the same uh, constraints. Um, I may have misunderstood you that it sounded like you're also talking about how you handle the um, the error type at the end, because you can have a, a big switch statement with error codes. And currently, and there's a reason I didn't really show that part, and that's because this is going to change. But currently, with error code, the only way you can say which error is it is to do it in a sequence of if statements. Because of that equivalence uh, property, you can't do it in a switch statement, because um, it's not, it's not going to use the, uh, the custom equals operator. So you have to do it manually. But by the time we get this, we should also have pattern matching, hopefully, which I didn't talk about now, but that actually dovetails with this quite nicely. With pattern matching, you'll be able to check against a particular error type and then get that um, error type out uh, in one go, uh, which is, again, that's what happens in, in Swift. Uh, it uses pattern matching instead of um, separate catch blocks. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but uh, may be useful information anyway. Hi. Um, you showed this statement with the uh, try keyword in front of a complex ex expression, like the yeah. nested expression, which implies all this wrapping and unwrapping from the mm -hmm. like the monad monadic sequence. Um, is there also a plan to allow more uh, more complex handling, basically, or would that mean that then I have to pull it apart into separate statements, basically, if I want to handle cases differently? Um, so the, the try keyword, if we have it at all, would be uh, per statement. So you can have multiple expressions which themselves may, may throw, as long as you have one try keyword on, on the overall statement. 
so you don't have to put it lots of times individually. At least that's my understanding of my, my reading of the paper as it is today. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I was just wondering if, that, if that's basically because it's yeah. the default case, what you want to do, that's just the only yeah. one that's supported, but maybe yeah, that's enough. Not, it, it could be enough, yeah. It's not required by the compiler to be there to make it work, so it doesn't have to be in any particular position. Um, so it's just applied to the whole statement. Okay, five minutes left. I think we've got some time for a couple more questions, if there are any. Huh? Thank you. Well, thank you very much.